Hello everyone, it is John of Fred and John Talks. Hi, I'm Fred. I'm John. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Today, we're going to have Fred talking about his career as a psychologist and therapist. Basically, he's going to outline his career and his motivations, maybe people who influenced him. So, we hope you'll enjoy this. And if you like what you see, uh, send it on to your friends, share, like, pass it on. I want to uh, mention something at the very end, Fred, when you get all done about an upcoming episode that I think will really interest our listeners and, and viewers, too. Okay. Okay? Yeah. So take it away, Fred. Okay. Fred's history. All right. Well, John, uh, we just posted uh, John's episode about his career yesterday. Uh, and he started out, um, he studied in Australia, and he was kind of a globetrotter. My uh, story of my education is far less exotic, uh, so I'm just going to kind of blitz through that. I got both of my degrees, my bachelor's and my master's, at the same college. Mm. Iona College in New Rochelle, New York. Now, the joke at the college always is, People ask you, oh, where'd you go to school? And you say, I own a college. And they say, you own a college? Of course. You know, it's like saying, I own a house. I own a car. <laughs> but I, I uh, circumvented that. And a lot of times when people ask me where I went to school, I would say, Iona in New Rochelle, New York. I-O-N-A. I think there's uh, some kind of island, uh, Ionia, it was named after. Anyway, it's a Catholic college. My bachelor's degree I got in theology and religious studies. I was in the seminary at the time. And then uh, some years later, uh, I got my bachelor's degree in 1983, my master's degree in 1992, and I did a lot of wandering around in between those years, which I'll explain and talk about. So um, the lead up to becoming a therapist was that for years, uh, af uh, before and after I got my bachelor's degree, I gravitated toward jobs in social work in what's called the helping professions. Um, I worked for five years for the ch Catholic Church in New York State. I worked on the strip at, down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida with runaway and homeless teenagers. Uh, I was the director of social services for the American Red Cross in my hometown. Um, but in between that, I took some side roads and at the time was very frustrated by it, but it has a happy ending. For example, I was a Mason's apprentice for Ooh, a while. Really? Yes, I was down in Florida in the summers too, outside. You know, you know what they say about Masons? They build monuments to themselves. <laughs> I worked in the kitchen at a restaurant. Uh, I taught in a high, at a Catholic high school and didn't make enough money to uh, meet my budget. So I had to park cars at a restaurant and then I worked in the kitchen and I was very frustrated. Um, but in hindsight, you know, God lets nothing go to waste. All of that was preparing me by life experience, which calls to mind a famous saying um, that goes like this. I was always careful not to let my schooling interfere with my education. Mm. You know, and when John talked about all his travels yesterday, and I'm talking today about all this wandering around I did, at the time I thought it was, uh, well, it was frustrating, but kind of meaningless, and I didn't feel my life had a direction, but God had a plan. There's an old saying, God writes uh, straight with, uh, you know, zigzag lines, you know, crooked lines. <laughs> so, in hindsight, yeah. everything came together. So, um... As far as my work history, um, I started, and when you know, even when you come out of uh, graduate school and you have a master's degree, uh, in the world of employment, you're at the bottom rung of the ladder. Yeah. So I put together, I coddled, cobbled together three part time jobs, uh, you know, including the graveyard shift at a psychiatric hospital. Uh, at, the, at the hospital, I eventually became the intake coordinator. I did all the interviews for people who were either going to come in the hospital or not. It was, a, like I say, a psychiatric hospital. And again, the learning was piled up. 
the learning just doesn't go on just when you're in the classroom. Uh, so uh, that's where I started. Um, then I worked at a place called Timber Ridge School, uh, which is a residential school for emotionally disturbed and delinquent boys, um, all of whom did not want to be there. It was not an easy job, but uh, it was a school of hard knocks, and I learned an awful lot there as well. That's, that's close to Winchester, Virginia, isn't it? It's, it's about uh, it's 15... Uh, some people don't even know about it. It's, it's out in the sticks. It's about 15, 20 miles outside of town. Um, yes. And, you know, you mentioned before who influenced you. I, I didn't get into that uh, because this can turn into a long uh, session, but I will say that I was influenced by uh, people who are, you know, they're not, they're not famous, just like you name names, or they're, they're not famous, but a lot of the uh, supervisors and the workers at Timber Ridge School were totally devoted to the work they did, and I learned so much from them and from my fellow counselors. As, and I'll just throw this in now that I brought up the subject. Um, in graduate school, some of my favorite, you know, psychological theorists were uh, Carl Jung, uh, that's not Y-O-U-N-G, that's J-U-N-G. Jung, yeah. Yeah, he was either German or Austrian, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I loved his writings and his work, um, and I loved the writings and the talks of Rollo May. Uh, my favorite book of his is called Love and Will, um, Rollo May, uh, but there were so many, so many others. Um, so from Timber Ridge, this is where uh, my life does get a little exotic. I had always wanted, bring brought up uh, Italian American. I had always wanted to live in Italy, and I was ma I'm divorced, but I was married to a woman who grew up internationally. Her father worked for the government, government, and they were, lived in different countries, and. Um, I was looking for a program to get my PhD. I wanted to get a PhD, a doctoral degree, in Christian spirituality and counseling. Mm -hmm. And they had very little to nothing to offer in the area where I live. And even in Northern Virginia, I went down and had interviews for different programs. Well, one day, um, I wasn't even there. I was actually working on a weekend at Timber Ridge School. And my wife comes home from church. I come home from work. She says, you know, I was talking to Father Kleinman and telling him that, you know, you want to get this Ph.D. And he says to me, why don't you guys go to Rome? He said, they have programs entirely in English and they're dirt cheap. Ooh. And between Michelle, my ex-wife, Michelle's love of international things, my desire to live in Italy and possibly learn the language and... A PhD program that didn't cost much, uh, we went. And uh, as timing would have it, uh, six months before, I'm sorry, nine months before we left for uh, Italy, we found out that we were pregnant with our first child. I thought that was going to put the gabosh on the whole thing, but uh, Michelle said, no, we're going. So um, anyway, uh, we went to Italy with an infant. And it was quite an adventure. I could do 10 episodes on our two. It was only two years in Rome, but it was power packed with great experiences. Well, the international language in Italy is food, is it not? <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> and, but, I, and I know how much you love pasta and food. Indeed. Well, uh, the, um, it's interesting you say that because the international language, uh, people would say to me, you, you lived in Rome and I had a private practice out of our apartment. And they said, you, you speak Italian? I said, no. Uh, what I learned is in our research leading up to moving over there is that at any given time, this was uh, 1999 to 2001, I don't know what the case is now. At any, any given time, there are approximately 50,000 people living in Rome who speak English. And they're from all over the world, including Australia, sure. England, wow. other English-speaking countries, and of course, America. So... Um, I didn't get my PhD. It turned out when we got over there that their educational system was very different and I was going to have to take courses over that I'd already taken. Oh, so you didn't get your PhD. I didn't get my PhD, uh -huh. but I went to four semesters of school at St. the uh, 
university, the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas. That's a mouthful. In other words, it's sponsored by the Pope. And that's where Pope John Paul II got his doctorate. But when you went, and, and it was taught by the Dominican uh, uh, priests uh, and, and nuns, uh, but when you walked, well, anywhere you walked in Rome, you felt like you were walking back in time. But when you walked into those hallowed halls, it was an old school. You felt like you were time traveling. So that was a fabulous experience. Who cares? I didn't get the PhD. I, I just wanted an experience of living in Rome. You had an education plus. And also part of my ongoing education. That is correct. While I was living in Rome and had my own private practice, uh, I have a, um, uh, what did I call it? Show and tell. Remember when we were kids? I used to love show and tell. You bring something in and you talk about it. While we were in Italy and I was seeing clients at my apartment, I had one exception. I was tracked down by an Italian couple who spoke fluent English, although with a thick accent. They and their son had spent some years in America but their son, now an adult, uh, was very sick. Uh, he had, to put, to put it impolitely, fried his brain with street drugs. And he was agoraphobic. He hardly ever left. They got an apartment for him and he lived there, assisted by some people they hired. Well, they asked me to counsel him. And they were people of means. His father was a doctor. His mother was a famous artist, as you'll see. Uh, uh, in a minute, um, they wanted me to see him three times a week. So oh, I took God. like three buses and a subway to get to his apartment. I had to go to him. Oh. But um, as time went on, uh, you know, of course, he would never recover. You can't counsel a person's brain back into health, but you can counsel them and help them have a better quality of life. Well, it was Christmas time, and his mother, who was an artist, and one of her specialties was she had helpers who would collect uh, driftwood on beaches, and then they would sand them down. They were highly polished, and then she would make these small drawings. I'm going to hold this up and hope that, I'm, that you're seeing it right. It's a lighthouse with crashing waves around it. And she sat us down. The, the son's name was Fabrizio. Fabrizio, her in the middle and me on the other side. And she gives me this as a gift. And she tells a story in her broken English. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. She says her son, Fabrizio, is shipwrecked and he's drowning. And I'm in the lighthouse as the counselor helping him try to find his way to safety. Wow. I started to cry, not sob, but <clears throat> tears were in my eyes and it was just so moving. And I tell that story not only because it's, it's a beautiful story and a, a sort of semi-tragic uh, because of the lack of quality of life of his. Um, when I came, then came back to the States, I worked for a group practice on Braddock Street in Winchester, Virginia, and uh, for two years. And I kept this on my wall right as people exited. You know, when they came in, they didn't see it, but as they exited my counseling office, they would see it. And people started asking about it. And so I would tell the story that I just told you. <laughs> and they were enthralled. Well, don't you know, all of a sudden, I'm getting one gift after another from my clients Lighthouse. of lighthouses. Lighthouses. <laughs> Lighthouse calendars. Lighthouse uh, figurines. Uh, Lighthouse, uh, you know, hand stitchings, framed. And, you know, it so... Was a, it was a sign, Fred. It was a sign. Let me, let me, let me uh, you you get a sip. You finally absorbed the sign and realized that's what you should should call your practice. Well, you, you anticipated what I was going to say next. So after I was there two years, I was ready. I always wanted to be my own boss. And I was ready to go out on my own. My wife and I were talking and we said, gee, what should we call your practice? Duh. Lighthouse counseling. <clears throat> and what a powerful 
symbol a lighthouse is, huh? Oh, yeah. I mean, Big it's, time. it's just like me trying to get Fabrizio to safety, as his mother said. Mm -hmm. it, it's there to help ships find safety and not, you know, wreckage. And light, light is hope. Light is direction. Yes. Yeah. Ships yes. depend on it. Captains of ships depend on it. Yes, they do. So um, I've been uh, on my own in my own private practice since 1993. Uh, it's um, 20 years of my own practice now, but I've been a therapist 31 years. And I continue to get all these uh, gifts of lighthouses almost became too much. Uh, when I fully retire, I'm, I'm, I'm almost retired, um, I'm going to have a whole house full of, because uh, I've tucked some of them away, they're in storage. I know uh, what I'm going to give you for Christmas. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, that's that story. I want to tell um, a story about something that was the most gratifying thing I've done in my profession. And that is um, something that was born of the fact that I had a recurring dream. I'm really shifting gears on you here now. Um, a pro from approximately the years 2003 into 2004, about a year, it was about a year and a half. I had a recurring dream and I had that dream three, four, sometimes five times a month. Wow. And even though I had taken a lot of training in dream interpretation. When I was in therapy myself, before I ever became a therapist, I had a therapist who was very good at dream interpretation. It's, it's through question and answer. It's not automatic. Um, I kept a dream journal for three years, but I could not figure this dream out. But I found out why. I found out because it was a timing thing. And again, it was a, what my ex-wife used to call God incidence, not a coincidence, a God incidence. God incidence. I won't go into the dream that would take too long. There's too many details, but here's what happened. And it resolved the meaning of the dream. In late 2004, my counseling office became a revolving door for men, individual uh, counseling with men who had a lot in common, especially they were carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. They had nobody to talk to about it. Or even if they did, they were ashamed, like a lot of men, embarrassed that they couldn't solve their own problems. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the men, unfortunately, uh, did not have any kind of support system. Sometimes I was asked, do you, do you have one best friend? Uh, yeah. Is it, who is it? my wife mm -hmm. and guys need john and i have talked about this since the introductory session yes we have guys need guy friends yes so um i the interpretation of the dream was that i had a calling to start a men's support group and it was specifically a christian men's support group because what i left out is they were carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders they had no support system but they were deeply seeking God and their faith journey. Okay. So I did that, I facilitated that men's group for eight years. We met every other Saturday for an hour and a half for eight years. We went on two retreats a year, but I did the whole thing, I'm not bragging, pro bono. I didn't, and I told my wife one day, I said, the thing, I'm coming back to where I started, the thing that I find most gratifying in my work, as much as I love doing marriage counseling and all this other stuff and counseling individual women, um, the thing I most find, find most gratifying, I don't even make a penny for. And I just praise God and I just thanked him that I can give back and I can make a difference in people's lives. Mm -hmm. Now, that is uh, a good lead into my next point. My ex-wife had benefited greatly, that's an understatement, from getting professional therapy before we got married. And uh, when I w one of the nicest compliments she ever gave me um, were two things she said to me. She said, you know, 
you're a really self-made man and even though there's really no such thing because you always need help and uh, yes. uh, learning from other people yes. uh, she was paying me a compliment because uh, you know I I was very persevering even after all those years of wandering around and I found my calling but she said to me uh, based on my experience she said based on my experience of counseling you're in the business of saving lives John talked about saving lives yesterday in his medicine practice. Yes. And I want to tell you one anecdote. It was from the men's group about saving lives. Um, I don't want to get into this other topic, but I'm just going to mention it in passing. You cannot work in the mental health profession for 31 years and not have clients who suicide. And I, there's five suicides of clients I've had that are burned into my brain. I just have to try not to think about them. Yeah. So I'm not going to go there, but that is part of the, you have to develop a thick skin. Um, one time at one of the men's groups, a new fella came. Now, there was a core group of guys who started out early uh, in 2004 and became what I called core group. They stayed all eight years till 2012. But then there were hundreds and hundreds of men who came once or twice. Maybe it wasn't for them and they didn't come back. Maybe they got what they needed in one session and you didn't see them again. But all kinds of stories. But here's the story I want to tell. So this new guy comes and throughout the whole hour and a half, he doesn't say a peep. He doesn't even introduce himself. Because I said as the facilitator, uh, for all the new people who come, and we always had new people, um, you could say as much or as little as you want. You can listen the whole time or talk the whole time. Mm -hmm. And he chose the former. He didn't say a word. At the end, I said, you know, before we call it a day, does anybody have anything they want to say that they didn't get a chance to say? And he stood up and he said, and I quote, you guys saved my life today. Oh, wow. And we said, Oh, wow. You know, what do you, what do you mean? Can you explain what you mean? And he said, I heard about this group. I've been putting off coming. And this morning I woke up and I thought, I'm either going to give the group a try or today I'm going to kill myself. That's how close it is. Yeah. Every minute for people who are depressed, who have loneliness or mental health issues, it can be a very fine line, can it? Very it's fine line. It's a thin thread, my friend. Thin thread. So, um, my last, whoa, my last, uh, oh, two more things. Over the years, I've had um, young therapists ask if I would mentor them, and I've mentored a couple. Um, and uh, I bring this up because I just want to say, uh, share with you one thing I said to them, among a lot of other things, but this is, uh, what's most endearing to me, and I mean it with all of my heart. I used to say to them, if you don't love every one of your clients, even those, and maybe especially those who are hard to love, you're in the wrong profession. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. therapy is not just sterile, book learning, no. you know, distant. Um, it entails a, a type of love, a professional love but a love nonetheless. Some people are very hard to love too. <laughs> you bet. And last but not least, uh, I would share with them and um, I would share with uh, others because uh, for this I have another show and tell. I would share that I highly, I I highly recommend that you develop a philosophy of life. And you can either come up with that yourself or you can borrow it from someone you want to emulate. Um, you know I'm a baseball man from all these videos. The great Babe Ruth, who's considered one of, if not the greatest baseball players who ever lived, said early in his career, I was looking for someone to model my swing after, and I couldn't find anyone better than Joe Jackson. If you've ever never heard about him, they called him Shoeless Joe Jackson. That is the man on which the movie Field of Dreams is based. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. So Babe Ruth modeled his swing on Joe Jackson.
<laughs> I modeled my philosophy, philosophy of life after Dr. James Dobson. You may or may not be familiar with him. Um, he, uh, many, many years ago, he's been around a long time, started a, a, a ministry called Focus on the Family. He became so, so famous and well-known for his writings and his work that, uh, you know, he testified be, uh, before Congress on matters of the family and so on. But anyway, here's the plaque. I'm just going to hold it up quickly, but I'm going to read it to you. I have this on my wall, and everybody who comes to my office sees it. And this is what he said. I will consider my earthly existence to have been wasted unless I can recall a loving family, a consistent investment in the lives of people, mm. and an earnest attempt to serve the God who made me. Bravo. Bravo. Investment in people is more important than investment in stocks and shares. You got it, brother. <laughs> very good. Thank you. Fred, that's uh, a very meaningful talk about your career. I hope those viewing us have uh, learned something uh, and maybe been inspired by some of what Fred has said. Uh, <clears throat> it's a very meaty subject, mental health and being a counselor. So I applaud you for, for getting this far down the road with being a counselor. It's a, it's a very tough trick. Uh, and you covered a lot of ground with teenagers and men and couples. So uh, keep up the good work. Thank you, John. I have one more thing to say. Uh, in the next week or two, Fred and I are going to tackle a subject that is going to be, I think, a landmark discussion on loneliness. And I'm going to summarize what's been going on in Great Britain since 2017 and 18, right up through 2023. And Fred's going to summarize what's going on uh, in America and in the U.S. about loneliness, because we believe it's a topic that is so germane and related to so many other things going on with men's lives, families' lives, and kids right now. Yes. So I'll finish with that. Hope you'll look forward to uh, following following us on that. And just to piggyback on that, um, so uh, you don't get confused, we did an episode on loneliness, um, but now we're taking it to a deeper level about what you can do about it. Yes. As John said, what they're doing in, in England and uh, uh, different things that uh, I recommend to my clients. Maybe John has ideas, uh, different things we've read about uh, actions you can take and so on and so forth. So I think that's a wrap. That's a wrap.